I'd like to thank everybody for supporting us on our uh, wild dog trapping channel and uh, especially the comments we're getting from people from all around the world and the love that people oh. show for our Border Collie dogs. But that gives me one of the things I want to talk about with regard to one of the main questions that people ask and that is, are we trapping dingoes or are we trapping wild dogs? We see those people with absolutely no empathy at all for dingoes. But we also see some people with absolutely no empathy for landowners and even less for their stock, even if they're standing in their own innards. This is a, an argument that has been raging on now for decades in this country. Some people have adopted the 1400 AD date as gospel. Before that, it's just got to be good and it's got to be native. And after that, it's evil, it's bad, it's introduced. This is pure lunacy. So what was termed as just a dingo uh, for many years encompassed everything that was seen in the bush, every type, type of dog. All the colour variations that were recorded at the time of the first fleet. Now they have isolated an actual gene uh, using DNA sequencing for our Australian dingo. Now, some people see them as being benign, they see them as being the apex predator uh, in this country, and they're saying they should be left alone. Now, if they're so benign, the first thing I'd say to people, let's go and get some and put them in Tasmania. Uh, because that's part of Australia too. Uh, let's put some down there because they be, have to be an asset for the environment. But anybody that's, that knows anything about this country would realise if you put them out in Tasmania, what you're going to see is no more Tassie devils, no more quolls. And if the thylacine is still there in a couple of little pockets, as which I believe it still is, they'll be gone too. It would be an absolute disaster to put them into that part of Australia. So what we've got to realise is right across this country, there's a big variation from one side to the other. When we talk about purebred dingoes, okay, there's a study done recently, and I think this highlights the hypocrisy that is in our scientific field now. It's led a lot of us to get to the point where we simply do not trust the science anymore because there seems to be corruption right through there. There seems to be an inbuilt bias. If we look at one of the studies, it shows a map of Australia and it says predominantly the, the wild dogs or what's classed as wild dogs are predominantly dingoes, they're purebred dingoes. Okay, but when you look at the map, you look at Western Australia and you'll see the coloration is red for pure dingoes right across there. And I'd, I'd agree with that because that's some of the most untouched country in the world. If you look at the eastern seaboard, look at the colorations there and you'll see the yellows and the orange and the greens, uh, all the different colors that denote that the wild dogs that are found through there are predominantly crossbred. Now, a lot of people say, oh, yes, they've got less than less than 15%, less than 10% of wild dog or domestic dog in them. So they are technically purebred dingoes. Okay, well, let's look at this little guy, Brandon. Brandon has been the sort of the pinnacle in many ways for me of 30 odd years of dog breeding. Now, his grandmother was one-eighth Australian coolie dog, okay? One-eighth coolie. His mum then, because she was then bred from a purebred border collie uh, father and the mother that was one-eighth, so she is one-sixteenth coolie. Then we come back and we cross again with uh, Dash to another pure border collie and we get Brandon which makes him a 32nd. So he is under 10% of anything else bar border collie. But we can still see the long legs. We can see the extra white. We see the little splash of white sometimes in the eyes of these dogs. We see the traits in, it, in those dogs that show that there is something else apart from straight border collie. 
and that's only less than 10 percent. So just the same way that a breeder can bring out positive attributes out of a dog, bring these recessive genes forward to give a dog longer legs or a different coat or a different coloration or a kinder character, nature will often select the animal with the best attributes for survival. And if this means a heightened killer instinct, then so be it. That's what we're seeing with a lot of these wild dogs that are kicking around there. They might have the yellow and white coloration of what is known as a pure dingo. And it could be 50% crossbred. It could only be 10%. You can see that that color, that splash of something else is in those dogs. There's another fallacy out there. The dingoes don't kill stock. What a load of rubbish. Uh, people say get gut samples. If you can find remains of livestock in their gut samples, then that proves that they're killing your stock. Not at all. It proves that they just don't eat them all the time. A lot of people need to understand that some dogs just like to kill. They get pleasure from it. Some say it's like a drug to them. This is reality. There's a big difference between a, an animal that's killing livestock and another one that's killing to eat that livestock. Most times what we're seeing is that uh, many of our real true dingo style animals out there, they kill simply for the fun of it. Now, there's a lot of people that will jump up and down about that, say that's wrong and rah, rah, rah. Rubbish. Get out in the bush if you'll open your minds and, and just give it a chance and you'll see that this is correct. Now, one of the things that happens too is quite often around here we see massive bushfires and oftentimes those bushfires are caused because of stupid green policy let's put it that way there's no other way to describe it instead of allowing more country to be burnt on uh, a rotational basis when it really has to be burnt oftentimes a lot of this country is locked up in national parks or forestry areas where it doesn't uh, they're not allowing cattle on it, they're not allowing the, uh, the herbage to be chewed down, to be trampled down. And when we do get a fire, we get this massive thing that comes through and just devastates everything. Now, things like dogs, like the wild dogs, can literally float out of there. They can get out of there ahead of that fire, but it does have a big effect on the native animals. Now, after one of these big fire events goes through, oftentimes you've only got the remnants of your native animals left in that area. But then the wild dogs, what people call is the apex predator, they come back in. And what happens then is their effect on those native animals is sometimes catastrophic because there's literally too many of these wild dogs for what's left in the area. This rhetoric that they're pushing that the wild dog is the apex predator is just delusional. Man is the apex predator. And it might be not just what we intentionally kill, oftentimes it's what man as a whole kills through things like roads, pollution, poisons, um, encroachment of uh, onto their living areas, uh, farming practices, all the different things we do all have a huge effect on wildlife. So whether we like it or not, man is the apex predator.